Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five virtual Cranbrook tour with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I'm Kevin Atkinson, curator with the Center, and today uh, we are celebrating the 93rd birthday of Bob Swanson, uh, who is the architect of the building that you can't quite see right now because I'm standing on top of it. And so today for our Live at Five tour, uh, we will be discussing the Albert and Peggy DeSalle Auditorium, which is built in between the Art Museum's Peristyle and the wonderful Orpheus Fountain. Now, this building really was needed uh, all the way back in 1942 when the Art Museum opened. Uh, there was a pretty immediate need for an auditorium. For many years, the Academy of Art used the auditorium uh, at the boys' school, so looking in archives all the way up until the late 1970s, the Academy's movie nights and lectures were often held at Cranbrook School for Boys, but that auditorium is pretty small. It's also in the middle of the prep school, not at the Art Academy. In the 70s, the Art, uh, the art Museum decided to put an auditorium in the galleries, and so they lost essentially a quarter of the museum gallery spaces in order to build a flat auditorium and lecture hall in the south wing of the building. And so in, uh, a, in and around 1983, there was a great discussion between past Cranbrook Academy of Art President Roy Slade and a legendary donor, supporter, gallerist, and artist in her own right, Peggy DeSalle. And Peggy, who was in her late 70s at this point, wanted to give a transformational gift to the Art Academy. And what exactly that gift would be was up for debate, but she finally settled on that I'm going to solve our auditorium problem. And she wanted to give an auditorium to the Academy of Art. The problem then was how did Roy Slade and Peggy DeSalle, who he had the donor, he had the money for the auditorium, he had the will, he certainly had the need, but where would it go? And so the problem went to Cranbrook's Buildings and Grounds uh, Committee as well as to the Board of Governors. And there was a certain uh, architect on that board who helped speculate to, to sort of imagine where the auditorium might be. And that architect was Bob Swanson. I mentioned at the beginning of the tour that we're doing the auditorium today because it's Bob's birthday, so happy 93rd to Bob Swanson. Uh, but if we go back in time to 1983, uh, Bob Swanson looked around the campus and thought, well, we could put an auditorium out there. We, maybe we could put it on the other side towards the Triton Pools. And they kept running into the problem of an auditorium is an intrinsically very large building and Cranbrook is a very perfect campus. And I don't think that Bob, as the grandson of Aelil Saarinen, wanted to be marring his grandfather's great, beautiful campus. And so Bob talks about uh, uh, sitting at a meeting and saying, you know, the place the auditorium needs to be is at the museum. It needs to be use the museum lobby. It needs to use the museum restrooms. The only place that could be would be right here. And so in the end, Bob Swanson suggests, and the Academy goes along with the idea of sinking the entire auditorium underground. Now, above ground, there are just a few glimpses that tell us there is a building underneath here. If you had visited Cranbrook up to 1983, one major change would be that there used to be grass right here. And all of these brick lines were actually hand cut grass in between concrete. And that would change when a building gets put underneath it. The other major uh, alterations are the intake and exhaust fans. And so this is what is allowing the auditorium to have air conditioning and heat. It's what is allowing the electricity and the telephone systems. Uh, you can see all sort of, of devices that are popping up. Now, Bob Swanson designed these to mirror trees that in the end were actually removed as part of the construction. Uh, he designed the intake and the exhaust vents to mirror the cedar trees that were here. And these were originally painted green and the green was meant to help mask the fact that this is a ventilation uh, shaft. 
And now Bob speaks, he talks about how these are really sculpture as much as architecture. And so they're very much meant to be this sort of hidden sculptural piece that is popping up alongside the far western edge of the auditorium. Now he designed them to look like sculptural cedar trees, and you can see on this side there are some cedar trees that are still present. Now, we're going to head inside and go down to the auditorium, but before we do, a common misconception about where the auditorium actually is, is that it's under the fountain. And that is not the case. It actually stops right here, and part of that was so that they would not have to disturb the fountain. As part of the construction of the auditorium, the construction workers kept putting things in the fountain, kept st stacking material here, uh, as well as the, it was dis discovered that the figures of Carl Millis's Orpheus fountain were completely degraded. But for most of the construction, the fountain actually was here with the bronzes. Eventually, it was determined they were so damaged they needed to be removed and restored and reinstalled. But the auditorium itself does not actually come under the fountain, it stops right here. And then its far eastern edge is the emergency exit, which uh, Bob told uh, the Cranbrook archives about 10 years ago that he was a li little disappointed that the cedar trees had been removed because had the cedars, which you can just see some of them are still over here, had the cedars remained on all three sides of the Orpheus Fountain, you really would never know that there was an emergency exit coming up. Now, I do want to uh, head inside because Andromeda and Olivia at the Art Museum are holding the door open for me, but they need to close and go home, so I want to go ahead and sneak inside the museum, and I'll talk a little bit more about who Peggy DeSalle was and who Bob Swanson was. As we go, uh, the auditorium does not go under the museum. It simply connects to the existing uh, uh, lower level of the gallery. One change that had to be made, Aliel Saarinen designed two rows of the limestone pavers and a very late date in construction, they could not balance the height of the limestone and the height of the roof deck. And so they had to make the decision that they would slightly alter the original design here in order to create a perfectly flat connection between what is essentially the roof of a new auditorium and an unchanged pavers style with the original stone from 1942. So the building is about 58 feet from the edge of the column to the edge of the fountain and then 78 feet wide from the emergency exit on one side to the vents on the other. And our next stop is to now go 28 feet deep and see the auditorium itself. So we will one of the, the great design features of the building was that as they were doing space studies and sort of thinking about how expensive would it be to build an auditorium on the back of the art museum, how expensive would it be to build one in the woods, how expensive would it be to build one underground. And the interesting thing is that building underground is never easy, it's never cheap, and it's never going to be the most cost effective. But the solution to why this ended up happening here was that every other site required that they build new parking or new restrooms, a new lobby, a new security system. And so the, the Board of Governors and the sort of uh, Cranbrook leadership was convinced that the smart solution of going underground because we will use the museum doors, we'll use the museum restrooms and the museum security. And so though it is an entirely new building, we enter in through Aliel Saarinen's monumental bronze doors leading into Cranbrook Art Museum. And of course the auditorium does connect to both sides, so one can also walk into the auditorium through the library, which those of you who have come to my Monday night lectures, Mondays the museum's closed, we go in that direction. The rest of the lectures, we go in through the museum doors. If you had weight o vision you would know that these doors are incredibly heavy. And perhaps a later live at five, we will explore the With Eyes Opened exhibit. It will be on view here at the museum until September. Uh, and I want to thank Andromeda at the desk for keeping the museum open tonight so that we can follow the very smart solution of Bob Swanson, which was to connect his auditorium entirely through his grandfather's architecture. So this building, 
other than the removal of the pretty horrible lecture hall that was taking up the South Gallery, Bob doesn't change anything here. He uses his grandfather's design from 1942. And if you go back in the plans of this building, this entire wall is new. The museum originally went straight further back. Over the years, this had been uh, new walls had been added, uh, new storage had been added, but really if we're talking about doing a tour of DeSalle Auditorium, we do have to talk about this entire area because Bob Swanson really cleaned up and got rid of a lot of fake walls uh, in order to slide the auditorium in here. Uh, one thing that he relied on was an earlier change to the museum from about 1954 when Henry Booth uh, designed new restrooms for the art museum. And so the restrooms, which are actually situated underneath the stairs of the art museum, uh, and so these are looking out underneath the stairs, and they get progressively smaller as you go down. These had been added in the 50s. Bob Swanson relied on those to free up space for the Peggy DeSalle Gallery. He added a coat room right here, uh, and then we'll step into the auditorium in a moment. Now, now that we're inside and Andromeda can close the museum for the day, I want to talk a little bit about who Bob Swanson was. Uh, this is a portrait by Zoltan Zepeshi of Eliel Saarinen, painted around 1940, 1945. So painted at the time that Eliel Saarinen was building the art museum, the last great work on the Cranbrook campus to be completed by our founding architect. Now, Eliel Saarinen, his birthday will be this coming Friday. Uh, Aero and Eliel Saarinen, both born on August uh, 20th in 1873 and 1910. But Eliel Saarinen had two children, both Aero and Pipson. Pipson Saarinen uh, came to America when she was 18 years old with her entire family, settling in Evanston, Illinois, and then in Ann Arbor. And it was in Ann Arbor where Pipson falls in love with one of her father's great students. Uh, and so Pipson Saarinen runs off to Toledo. She elopes with Bob Swanson, J. Robert F. Swanson, Sr. Uh, and J. Robert F. Swanson had served as the Saarinen's translator. He was from the Upper Peninsula. He spoke Swedish in his native tongue. He was also best friends with Henry Booth. And so Harry Booth and Bob Swanson had been studying at the University of Michigan together. They traveled throughout Europe in 1922 and 1923 on their grand tour. And they even set up a professional architectural office in 1924. And so the office of Booth and Swanson, this is the Bob of DeSalle Auditorium, his father again, uh, Booth and Swanson, the son of uh, Cranbrook's founders, George and Ellen Booth, the son-in-law of Cranbrook's architect, Eliel Saarinen. They built buildings like the Christchurch Cranbrook Rector's House, the Art Academy Administrative Building, as well as a number of projects in and around Bloomfield Hills in Birmingham. And it was in this partnership of Booth and Swanson uh, when, in 1926, Pipson and Bob eloped, and then in 1928, Bob Swanson the second junior, I, I don't think he is second or junior, but the second Bob Swanson was born uh, on August 18th, 1928. Now his father would leave Henry Booth in professional practice the next year in 1929, and Bob Swanson Sr. and Eliel Saarinen would remain in practice from 1929 until 1947. Now, of course, Aero Saarinen was Bob Swanson's uncle, uh, and he was also part of the family firm. Now, Bob has told me a few times about what it was like growing up at Cranbrook, and I'm really hoping that some point this fall, uh, we'll be able to do a program with Bob Swanson, and he can talk to you about some of the stories growing up, because they're a pretty amazing series of events that he went through as the grandson of the uh, Aliel and Loya Saarinen. But the long story short is that he grew up going to Brookside. Uh, uh, he fell in love with Florence Knoll, who was, of course, a Cranbrook student who was an orphan and who uh, 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 
uh, spent a lot of time with the Sarnins, and, and Bob describes her as this you know, beautiful young lady that he looked up to as a little kid. Uh, Bob Swanson, during the Great Depression, would go over to the Vaughn School, but he came back to Cranbrook in 10th grade, and he graduated in the class of 1946 from Cranbrook School for Boys. He then studied with one of his grandfather's students, Carl Feiss, at the University of Denver, where uh, Carl Feiss or Feiss had set up an architecture program. He studied there for two years, then he came back from Denver to the University of Michigan for three years where he earned his bachelor's degree, and then he went off to MIT to uh, earn his master's in architecture. And it was his grandmother, Loya Saarinen, who paid for him to go to MIT. While he was at MIT, he studied with Buckminster Fuller, and he got to know many of the members of the Architects Collaborative and other is sort of the Cambridge circle of modernist architects that were so different in their own way from the circle of Cranbrook, sort of gentler, kinder modernist here under Aliel Saarinen. Now, Bob Swanson would come back. He worked for his grandfather both right after high school in 1946, and again after graduating from MIT, he came back and worked with his father and mother at Swanson Associates, where he helped design uh, Andover High School, Seaholm High School, as well as Oakland University's Kresge Library. Now, Bob Swanson has told the archivist, uh, we have this in the record, that DeSalle Auditorium is probably the best building he ever did, although you can't see it. And for the next part of our tour, now that we know a little bit more about Bob Swanson, I'd like for us to look at this building that above uh, ground is sort of invisible, and then we come downstairs and we're welcomed into this very beautiful late modern uh, underground auditorium. And so welcome into the Albert and Peggy DeSalle Auditorium. It opened on November 11th, 1986. Uh, it was scheduled to open on April 11th, 1986, but like every construction uh, ever, it came in late and over budget. Uh, but we are grateful to the generosity of Miss Peggy DeSalle uh, for giving the million dollar gift to help construct this auditorium. Eventually it would cost a million five. They, uh, uh, Peggy gave another 350,000 and then the final 200,000 that it took to actually build this building came from selling off the naming rights to the chairs. Uh, so if you are watching and you were a donor who helped take part in this campaign in the 1985, uh, um, uh, thank you. The chairs still are signed by all of those people who gave uh, donations to bring us over the line and into the finished product. Now, Albert and Peggy DeSalle are recognized right here. I was talking with Deborah Rice, the head archivist, earlier when I was doing this research, and I said, giving an auditorium is great because every student at Cranbrook knows DeSalle Auditorium. Uh, we, it is, you know, DeSalle. It's a one-named place. Uh, but there is a lot more to Albert and Peggy DeSalle. I'm not sure I'll go too far into their biography here on Live at Five, but they're really fascinating couple. Um, Peggy DeSalle was born in Hungary in 1904. She moved to Detroit at the age of six in 1910. She studied photography at the DIA. Her parents were art artistic and musical. Uh, and she also studied weaving at Cranbrook under Marian Strangel. She was married to Zoltan Zepeshi, Cranbrook's second president and head of the painting department. Uh, and then they divorced and she married Albert DeSalle. Albert DeSalle had been a founding member of the Scarab Club. Club. He was in the, the founding member of the Bloomfield Birmingham Art Association, and he was also in charge of the J.L. Hudson Company Art Department. So a very artistic couple. Albert died in 1964, and Peggy died a few months before the auditorium finished in 1985. It was meant to open on April 11th because that was Peggy's birthday. Again, it opened November 11th, 1986. And for the rest of the tour, now that we know a little bit about Albert and Peggy and we know about Bob Swanson, I'll just take us through some of the features of the auditorium. I'm sure that many of you watching have been to lectures here. Uh, it is a little bit, if you are a sort of spatial thinker, it can be a little bewildering how you get to this room because you come through Aliel's art uh, museum, which is so grand, the enormous galleries, the beautiful bronze doors, and then you come into the lobby of the, the DeSalle galleries, which are just so tiny and cozy and very intimate. Um, and then you open up into this very large 28-foot 
room uh, that seems to come out of nowhere because there's really so little sign that you'll turn the corner into this space. It is there are a lot of very clever design features that were designed by Bob Swanson and then executed by the uh, construction team led by Jim Partridge, uh, uh, or he was the mechanical and electrical engineer. I don't have the contractor here. Forgive me, O oh contractor. And I think the most interesting feature of the auditorium is how very close it is to the pavers. Uh, there is just eight inches of material between the top of the concrete, so the, the highest part, to the where you are stepping is just eight inches. That is a tiny, tiny ceiling for a building. Uh, and how did they do it? Very clever engineering, essentially building a parking deck underneath the museum, uh, underneath the plaza. Now, it needed to be that thin because the entire entrance sequence relies on Aliel Saarinen's lower gallery level. And so you have the existing height of the peristyle where the columns actually land, which is sort of in line with the door. You have that height that you can't go any higher than above the peristyle. You couldn't pop up above the fountain. But then you also couldn't go any lower than right here because that's the line of the lower gallery. And yes, you could have stepped in, but they didn't want to do that. And so in order to sneak this building in, you have to have this eight inch ceiling. And that was one of the reasons why they decided to put bricks instead of grass back on the roof. Because in order to grow grass on the roof of this building, they would have needed to have a thicker floor plate that no one wanted to do. Now, the uh, ceiling beams are interesting. You'll notice they're wider rather than taller, which would have been the more traditional way of engineering. But again, Bob Swanson was very focused on how could he get the most amount of space into this auditorium. And when I step back and we look into the auditorium, you can really see that if this beam was any lower, it would completely block the screen. It would really push you down. And what Bob Swanson wanted to do was to bring us into the auditorium and to not have you feel like you're in some sort of crypt. And so by flattening these beams and running them at a sort of alternative angle that is structurally slightly um, less efficient, but the payoff and the aesthetic and the experience is really worth it. Now, the entire building, one of the big delays was that Michigan has laws about when you can pour concrete and it has less to do with the weather and more to do with Michigan roads. All of you watching know that Michigan probably has the worst roads in the country because we allow way too heavy of trucks to go up and down our highways, as well as the winter weather. Uh, and there is a law in Michigan that you cannot pour concrete, you cannot run a concrete truck over uh, roads at certain temperatures. And the March of 1985 was very cold, and so they could not get the concrete poured until April. It added a six-week delay. Once they poured the concrete, they poured it uh, all in one day. So the columns had already been poured in the fall. It took from June to October just to dig the hole, but as they were digging the hole, they were pouring the walls. So the walls were up, they were waiting on the deck or the ceiling. And even that the fact that the architectural blueprints call it a deck and not a roof, I think speak to this construction as really, it's a very utilitarian construction. It's like a parking deck. So they pour all of these beams and the roof in one day, one enormous pour, lots of stress, I'm sure, lots of precision. And then there are holes in this beam that have steel wires. And those steel wires, one week after they poured the concrete, so it's not fully dry, but it's certainly not wet, they then tension the wires on either end. And so think about a suspension bridge uh, or any sort of wire that's in tension is going to be very strong. And so these are cast in place post-tensioned beams. And that pulling of the, the wire through the column is what allows us to drive trucks and things over the top of this auditorium. Now, one of the uh, features of the building is that we are only in the middle section. So there are, um, I don't know, 12 feet on either side of the column. Uh, and this is how Bob Swanson sneaks in the mechanical systems. And so I have always admired that when one is here in the auditorium and you're sitting for a lecture and you look up at the ceiling and you have this lovely sort of telescoping of the air conditioning units as they come out over 
the auditorium. And it is a really subtle design, but I think a very elegant design. As I was preparing for today's tour, uh, Bob spoke about this and why he did it this way. Again, it's not necessarily the most efficient way to design ducks, though it's not particularly inefficient. Instead, what it is, he did not want to have to put a drop ceiling in. And so he figured if I'm not covering up the ductwork, then I need to make the ductwork beautiful. Very much a lesson he would have learned from his grandfather, Aliel, or his uncle, Aero, or his own father and mother, who are both architects and designers. It's a family of designers. They're going to think about the air handling units. And so instead of bringing out one big pipe that gets smaller as you get further, you know, less air, you're, so you're, you're shrinking the pipes. I think you can all picture what that would look like if you've ever seen exposed ductwork. Instead of getting one pipe that go, shrinks, he does three pipes that then drop the cooled or warmed air out over three different locations in the auditorium. Now, once you have this mechanical system designed, it's giving us a few benefits. One, it is a, a pretty strong and compelling architectural move. Um, not that there are ever boring lectures here at Cranbrook, but if there is, I, you see people look up and begin to sort of notice and study these subtle uh, changes. But it's also helping with the acoustics because a flat surface is going to bounce sound straight back and cause an echo. A round surface is going to diffuse the acoustics. And so the mechanical system, the round pipes, are helping with the acoustics of the building. And the other great acoustical change is the addition of uh, covered fabric panels across the back wall. So that sound coming from the front of the auditorium is absorbed instead of bouncing back. And so you'll notice that the side walls are solid and then the back wall is fabric so that the sound is coming out and it's going to reverberate back towards the audience and then be absorbed into this wall, deflected off the ceiling, and then very important carpeting throughout so that the carpet is also absorbing the sound. The burgundy chairs, as well as the gray carpet, and some of the other interior details were designed by George Zonars, who, like Bob Swanson, was a Cranbrook Board of Governor, and like Bob Swanson, was an architect. And so he was uh, considered interior architect consultant. He, he really helped with a lot of the uh, color palettes. I think if Bob's mother had been alive, Pitsan Sarden Swanson, she was, of course, a very talented interior architect and designer. And uh, so George Zonars is sort of playing the role of, of interior designer. Uh, what's interesting is they started with the gray carpet and then the red, the burgundy, came about because the budget was so thin and they were so over budget by this point. Uh, Zonars had to select a color that was already in production and one they could get on sale, which turned out to be the burgundy and he said, perfect, theaters have burgundy seats historically, Cranbrook will have burgundy seats as well. And I only found that story because uh, uh, an interviewer asked, what's the significance of burgundy to Cranbrook? And <laughs> that was the answer. Now, you'll also notice that there's a change from the upper level to the lower, that the carpeting runs up the side walls. And again, this is all for acoustics. And Bob Swanson was especially prepared to think about acoustics because he had worked uh, both in Cambridge and in Washington, D.C., I believe, uh, with Bob Newman, who is one of the sort of founders of acoustics in architecture. He worked on the Ford Auditorium out in Dearborn, as well as the Royal Albert Hall in London. And so Bob Newman, Harvard professor, uh, uh, Bob Swanson worked with him, and he really was the, the sort of preeminent acoustician working in, a, in this country in the 50s. And so Bob was thinking about those lessons from his earlier training as he began to design not just the shape of the auditorium, but the finishes and how those would affect acoustics. Now, we talked about the chairs, we've talked about the carpet. The carpet, some of you may remember, did change colors oddly, and it was unclear if that was a manufacturing defect or if it was a issue with the concrete coming leaching through the carpet. Uh, but it was tan carpet for quite a while, but it was always meant to be gray, and the gray simply shifted to tan. Uh, and now we have gray again. Now, the 
auditorium furniture. And if Bob is watching on his birthday, I hope he's out with friends and family celebrating his birthday. But if you're watching, uh, you can type a response. I believe that the auditorium uh, pedestal was designed by George Zonar, though I'm not sure. It does have this uh, strange little tumor that is our concession to laptops and the need to have a laptop on the podium. Perhaps one of our design students could come up with a better way of of extending the podium. But I love that the podium mirrors my favorite part of the auditorium, which is the little uh, balcony popping out over the auditorium. And Bob Swanson actually envisioned that this would be a place where you could preach, uh, whether that's a religious service, which has, of course, a long history at Cranbrook, or more likely an artist preaching to the the masses in the auditorium. Uh, Bob actually envisioned that you would have two options as a lecturer. You could either stand at the podium on the floor, or if you wanted to preach, you'd go up here and speak out to the auditorium. It was also originally how uh, accessible uh, a, a mobility accessible presentation could be given. So if you were in a wheelchair, you would be at the level of the parking lot, the level of the lower uh, galleries, and you could simply roll here or walk here and not have to uh, deal with any steps getting down to the floor of the auditorium. We'll talk about how uh, the auditorium meets life safety issues and uh, accessibility issues in a moment, because I think that is, again, a very clever Bob Swanson solution. Uh, So I mentioned that the seats, the 200 seats, are just the middle of the auditorium. And in the very first concept sketch of the underground auditorium, which Bob did in 1983 on... May 25th, 83, was the first sketch. It was actually oriented the other way. So the screen would have been there and the seats were going back like this. Through engineering studies, it was decided, you know what, if you build it this way, you actually are simply connecting to the building and you're not going to have to shore up the entire front of the auditorium. So this carpeted steps are actually the concrete foundation so that almost think of it as a buttress going up to the art museum and supporting those columns uh, instead of what they had to do on this wall, which was to build a series of essentially... um, Uh, uh, steel retaining walls coming down, and then a cast concrete retaining wall in order to keep what is essentially the Orpheus fountain right here and then backfill that Aliel Sarnan did to make a flat plaza on top of a hill. And then below the black backfill was earth and boulders. And so finally you have this sort of mix of materials. And this wall was really, I think, the most had to be the most engineered to keep this end of the auditorium stable and waterproof. And one of the problems that they hit was how do you drain a room that is now lower than the Cranbrook storm sewers? And so in the end, they didn't want to use a sump pump because all of us who live here in Southeast Michigan and those of you especially in Detroit know the problem if you plan on getting water out of your basement through a pump is that when the pump fails, you fill up with water. And so they had to do quite a bit of engineering work to hook up the drain below this building and to drain it into a stormwater system using simple gravity and not any type of sump pumps. There are also some 77 or 73 piles that were drilled down. So before the hole was excavated at all, they used a 14 inch drill and drilled 73 holes around the the perimeter and then filled those with concrete and steel. And that became the sort of exterior exoskeleton that then you could dig the hole out in the middle. And as they were drilling those holes, they kept hitting boulders. And there was a great debate among the engineers as to, okay, we wanted 73. If we can't get 73, if nine of them have hit a boulder, will this hole collapse? or not. And it's pretty funny watching the memos from Bob Swanson, the engineers, and Cranbrook's president, who is not an engineer, but a painter, being like, is this going to work? Is this going to work? And the engineers and Bob saying, yes, it'll be fine. It's over-engineered. We have, there's, there's room for error. And Roy Slade saying, please don't let the art museum fall into the auditorium before we've even started construction. Now, on this side is the mechanical equipment. So you see how the wall curves back? 
And so all of this mechan mechanical equipment is coming out of this giant utility room that I won't show you and out into the auditorium. And I'm standing here, it is perfectly quiet. You cannot hear any of the mechanical systems at all. And this is something that Bob worked quite hard with, uh, with Jim Partridge on to isolate the mechanical system. So all of the air conditioning, the heaters, the electrical transformers, they're all sitting on rubber feet and then the entire room is isolated from this room. So in a concert hall, you would never want to have an air conditioning unit with the wall to the concert hall. You'd really want it to be very far away. And so the solution was those rubber feet, the isolated room, and then bringing them up and over. And it is true, I can never hear any of the equipment when it's working. And so if the mechanical was on one side, you could either have an asymmetrical auditorium, or we can see what Bob Swanson did, which was to add storage closets underneath each side. And so this is the edge of that 78 feet wide, uh, and then this room goes back the full depth of the building. You can see it's being used right now as a little recording studio, as well as all of the supplies for uh, lectures here at the auditorium, as well as what must be considered Cranbrook's gloomiest conference table. So from here, a lot of you may not know that there is in fact a whole nother side to the building. And so I hope I don't lose you uh, as we take an adventure into the mechanical, the emergency exit. And so in this emergency exit, there is an elevator. And so this elevator allows uh, someone with uh, mobility issues to walk and then use an elevator to get from the upper to lower level of the auditorium. When we were outside, we looked at the stairway that comes out. So this opens directly into a stairway and then goes straight up. I will not open that and cause panic among our security system. But this is how, if yours truly was ever to give a preach, uh, give a sermon, uh, this is the way that you can navigate between the two levels of the auditorium. Now, this space is pretty interesting. Uh, so Cranbrook, as any of you who have worked here or studied here or been a patron of know, uh, we never have enough space. Uh, we are always in a space crunch. And so when they were discussing, do we put permanent seats up here? Because we built a 200 seat auditorium for a 150 student school. We could get 50 more seats if we added seats here. And Bob Swanson made the compelling argument, the correct argument, that in fact, it's not a terrible idea at a small institution where space is always an issue to have what we in the architecture industry would call unprogrammed space. And so what he does instead of putting permanent seats up here uh, is he gives us essentially an open air room. Uh, many of you who have served on Cranbrook's boards or attended conferences and meetings know that we have all sorts of conferences here. We have all sorts of lunches. There's another projector system up here so we can have job interviews. And then when it is a big lecture, it is a big event, Bob designs the uh, glass railing so that you can set high chairs up here and you can have this filled in with another I don't know, 25 seats, or the more likely outcome is that it's a popular lecture that you didn't know was going to be popular, and you begin to have students and faculty standing up here, and you essentially have a very flexible sort of overlook in the auditorium. It's currently being used by the art uh, uh, museum to prepare the art lab kits. So these are all kits that are going out to kids and students um, uh, as part of our continued outreach to Metro Detroit, bringing art into all different types of uh, families and kids. And so they're setting up those art kits now, showing again the value of having unprogrammed, no seats attached, sort of very flexible, large space in the building. Now, I talked to just briefly about Peggy DeSalle, and I neglected to mention what a force she was for Cranbrook. She was, of course, married to Zoltan Zepeshi, uh, uh, who was our second president and founding head of the painting department. But she was also a huge donor and uh, uh, sort of patron of Cranbrook. 
From 1949, she ran the Little Gallery on East Maple Road in Birmingham, uh, where she launched the career of really countless uh, Cranbrook artists. She was a maker, a kingmaker of artists coming out of Cranbrook through her gallery. But she also gave a lot of paintings to Cranbrook. And there are a lot of pieces in the Cranbrook collection that are either a gift of Peggy and Albert, or just Peggy, or they are purchased with funds given by Peggy to Sal. And what's interesting about the auditorium is that fairly late in the planning stages, the decision was made that on this side, where again, we have the mechanical systems here, we would add and I think very appropriate to Peggy's legacy as a donor of art, a painting vault. And so uh, I'm sure you have come to dozens of lectures here and never knew that there was this amazing vault right behind you. Of course, with the completion of the collections wing in 2011, the vault was removed of all of its paintings, and now it's just used uh, for storage and, and for different things in the auditorium. But for many years, this was the most dry and most secure place to store artwork here at Cranbrook. And now we can see the clever connection of the isolated air handling unit going into the auditorium here. Now, I did not uh, reach out to Laura to ask permission, so I hope she won't be mad. But since we're doing Live at Five, and these are always behind-the-scenes tours, uh, let's take a look into the control booth, which has had all sorts of changes over the years into a modern, internet-connected, digitally-controlled um, uh, presentation lecture, virtual lecture hall. And so this is all the equipment that Laura Bombeck and her team in the Cranbrook Academy of Art Media Department use in order to uh, host events and lectures here at DeSalle Auditorium. The projectors that show my slides for the History of Architecture program, the recorder that records everyone who says anything here so that future scholars can study what all's happened. And of course, this was led for many years, some 30 years, by Mike Paradise, who also had a collection of um, uh, historic audiovisual equipment that I'm a little bit sad to see has taken its must have gone with Mike uh, because none of the cool old projectors are up there. So I hope that this was a fun Live at Five for everyone. It was a little bit different. I feel like we've maybe gone back in time six months to when we were exploring full buildings. Um, when I set out to do today's Live at Five, after I saw that it was Bob's uh, birthday on Facebook, I thought, I think I know quite a bit about DeSalle Auditorium. And then once I got into the archives and started reading some of the fascinating uh, meeting minutes and oral history interviews and all of the uh, uh, work that went into planning and just how well considered every detail is here, I think I have a, a whole new appreciation of uh, DeSalle Auditorium. I also think I appreciate more what it was like to try and teach at Cranbrook before this auditorium was here and just how important it is to the community to have a room that can seat this many people uh, and that can allow such a really diverse array of presentations, programs, lectures, uh, etc. Uh, it came in perhaps in a uh, important way that the architect could never have imagined this past year uh, when it served as one of the only uh, large pandemic usable classrooms. And so uh, for the entirety of the 2021 academic year, this was used by Cranbrook schools and the students were separated by six seats. Um, it was pretty, I think only 30 people could fit in here by the time you got the six foot distance. Uh, but it's just another example of the benefit of having these uh, resources and having donors like Peggy and Albert DeSalle who enable Cranbrook to continue its mission into the future and continue to use buildings and, and resources in new ways to face unexpected challenges. I want to, again, I will show you all the, the backstage. You know, there is no backstage. It's not a theater. So here's all the accoutrement that we use for visiting artists, lecture talks, panels, discussion, you know, the small collection of Cranbrook designed furniture in the corner. Um, I want to again thank everyone for joining us for Live at Five. I was out on vacation for the past two weeks, but I'm here for the rest of the fall. And so I'm excited to continue exploring different parts of Cranbrook's campus and different uh, areas of Cranbrook's history with you all here on Facebook Live. I would 
again like to wish a very happy birthday to Bob Swanson here on his 93rd birthday. Um, I'm hoping that we can have him participate in a Cranbrook Center program yet this fall. Uh, he is always walking around. He lives just down the road. Um, if I am half as uh, uh, sort of out and about in the community as Bob is at 93. When I'm 93, I will be a very happy person. So I think that Bob is rightfully very proud of this auditorium. He's rightfully very proud of everything that his family did here at Cranbrook. And I think that uh, the DeSalle Auditorium is just, just another uh, building in the long chain of excellent, excellently designed, well thought out, fully planned, fully imagined and realized architecture that started with his grandfather, Aliel Saarinen, and continued uh, right up to November 11th, 1986, when DeSalle Auditorium opened. Thanks so much, and if you wanted to see the outside of the building, just as soon as I post this, you can scroll back in time and you can see that it is a pretty invisible auditorium here underneath Cranbrook Art Museum. Until next time, everyone, I'm Kevin Atkinson with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. Happy birthday, Bob. Happy early birthday, Aliel and Arrow. Until next Wednesday, everyone.